Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Stollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is Edgardo Miranda Rodriguez. Edgardo, welcome to Comic Culture. Thank you for having me, Professor Dollard. This is a great opportunity. Uh, I would have rather be there in person had we not been living through this pandemic, but you know what? I get to get this really cool view of all these amazing uh, action figures and artwork and Castle Grayskull behind you, so it still feels like I'm almost there, except I can't touch it. But even if I were there, I, you know, you really can't touch collectibles. That's, that's the whole <laughs> that's oh, the thing. Feel, feel free to touch anything you want on the shelves. <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, your career in comics, because you, you sort of came in from a different uh, way. Uh, so if you could talk a little bit how you got started uh, making comics. Yeah, it was about 14 years ago I curated my first exhibition. That was Santarian, The Art of Joe Quesada. Joe Quesada, for those who don't know, He's currently Marvel's um, uh, chief uh, creative officer, or rather vice president at this point. Um, he's in the newest uh, documentary on Disney Plus called um, Behind the Mask. Well, up until that point in his career, he was uh, editor-in-chief of Marvel, and he never had a solo art show. So I was an avid reader of this magazine at the time called Wizard. And given the fact that um, Marvel was such a small mom-and-pop shop before the, the Disney acquisition, you literally can just call them and just say, hey, I'd like to meet with Joe Quesada. So at the time, I was a freelance writer, reached out to him, uh, did a couple of stories, so I had a relationship with him. And I'm working on an art exhibition for uh, my client, um, Dr. Marta Moreno Vega of the Caribbean Cultural Center. And she said, listen, we have a grant um, coming up that's available if you want to curate an additional show once we wrap up this project you're working on. And I said, well, actually, I just read about this team of superheroes based on the Orishas. Um, I think it'd be great if I could reach out to Joe Quesada and maybe put together an exhibition. Uh, she actually thought it was a great idea because she is a Yoruba priestess herself. So the three of us got together at the Marvel offices, and that actually would become the genesis of my career in my own way in, in comic books. After that exhibition, which was a critical hit, I curated another exhibition, um, Marvelous Colors, celebrating Marvel's um, superheroes of African descent, also coincided with Marvel's 70th anniversary. And uh, that inevitably would lead to me actually producing and packaging graphic novels for such clients as John Leguizamo, the Tony Award winning celebrated actor and activist, and um, hip hop legendary icon Daryl DMC McDaniels of Run DMC. So gathering all of that professional experience as a curator, as a graphic novel, novel producer slash editor slash art director, I kind of decided five years ago, literally to the, to the date that we're having this conversation, that I should start getting into the space of telling my own story, start actually uh, cultivating storyline that speaks to something, well, I felt was underrepresented. And five years ago this month, I actually um, was um, introduced as a writer. I published um, my first comic book with Marvel, I wrote a story, teaming up uh, the thing and Groot. Um, but the biggest buzz that came out of that story was in the introduction of a new character to the Marvel um, universe. And that was actually an Afro-Puerto Rican grandmother who spoke about Taino mysticism and the Taino's indigenous peoples of the Caribbean. And she spoke to her grandson, who I named after my own biological son, my son, Kian. And so that inevitably showed me that there was a hunger. There was an audience for anything specifically talking about the Latinx experience, uh, specifically talking about uh, Latinx mysticism and, 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 and characters. And that left, left me with this um, idea of wanting to produce more. So instead of pitching um, back to Marvel another idea, I decided, let me go completely independent. And that's where I came up with the idea of La Borinquena. And five years ago, we self-published our first graphic novel of uh, our own superhero, La Borinquena. You pack a lot into just a few, a few minutes there. Uh, uh, and it's fascinating because it's, it's very tough to make an impact on an existing franchise or an existing universe, easy for me to say. Uh, but you were able to do that. You were able to take uh, uh, the, the character of Groot, who actually, I think, uh, you know, predates the Marvel Universe a little bit. And, and you were able to add something to that character that has become not only, uh, uh, you know, really embraced, but widely loved. And then you decide, instead of just, you know, playing with house money, you're going to go and start your own uh, your own IP. So when you're making that decision, how much of this is just, you know what, this is a great time to do it because I'm, I'm going to strike while the iron's hot. And how much of it is, I really hope this works out. I think a lot of that comes from having an amazing partner. Uh, my partner and wife, Kyung, 
she really believed in this idea of developing Labor in Kenya. She really felt that this was an opportunity and, and uh, the right time for us to do this for ourselves via our own studio. And, uh, and she has a career, celebrated career of over 20 years as a fine artist. So she knows the value of creating your own work, creating your own stories, creating your own brand uh, from your own talent. So we literally just invested in ourselves. And yes, this was a uh, uh, kind of like a, a long, not really a long shot. This was, a, this was a gamble. However, we did something that had never been done in the comic book industry. We actually introduced our IP in a nationally celebrated uh, event. And that was the Puerto Rican Day Parade in 2016. And we had someone cosplaying as La Borinquena on a giant float with close to 50 young people wearing T-shirts of La Borinquena. And we were selling those shirts to raise money for their scholarships. And we tagged that launch, you know, it, it literally tagged that launch of this character to uh, a humanitarian crisis literally occurring in Puerto Rico. And that was the $80 billion debt that was crippling the Puerto Rican economy and leading to a, a significant crisis that, was, that led to oh, close to 500 public schools closing, an increase in uh, tuition in the public universities, a massive um, brain drain where scientists and other engineers and many others were leaving Puerto Rico in the hundreds of thousands. Um, and, and obviously that was just 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 before Hurricane Maria would hit literally the, the year and a half later. So we decided to launch this character and, and, and it, and it kind of like launches big. And, you know, I'm doing all of these interviews. I'm being invited to the mayor of the city of New York's mansion when they're doing this event. I'm being flown out to Washington, D.C. to speak at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. And I didn't even have a comic book yet. All I had was this poster and, and an image and the first two or three pages of the comic book. I didn't have the book yet. And Kyung was literally saying, you know, we're getting a lot, a, a lot of buzz, and we don't even have a book. So let's invest. Let's take a shot because, you know, there's a chance that we might get something good out of it. Now, she teased me a little bit, and she said, I, you know, I never really saw you much as a writer, so hopefully you can, we'll come up with a really good story. And so she planned and packed us up. We went to Puerto Rico for a month. We lived there with the boys and immersed ourselves. Even though, even though culturally my heritage is Puerto Rican, I really wanted to tap into the, 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 the vernacular, the idiom, the, the culture, the, the energy on the island, particularly of young people, because I was introducing a character though, though she was born here in New York City, she was moving to Puerto Rico. So while, while there and, and for that month, story just came to me. I recall one time walking through the rainforest and her origin story literally came to me as we're like hiking through the rainforest and waterfalls are like rushing down our side. And so we did take a chance. We self-published this book and immediately it gets mainstream buzz, which is something that's unheard of because we didn't have a, a, a marketing firm, a PR agency or any kind of management that was actually steering or even developing some sort of strategy. We just kind of put it out there and, 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 and gratefully they were, you know, we're very grateful that they were very, very adamant writers and, and at the Washington Post or the New York Times or at NBC and all these mainstream outlets that wanted to talk about La Borinquena. So before we knew it, we developed an IP independently, but she immediately became mainstream because mainstream media was talking about it. And, I, and, and the, the, the funny thing was Latin media came after the fact. So it's not like we went straight to Telemundo or straight to Univision. Once we were on CNN and once we were on on NBC or on HuffPost, all the other Spanish media outlets are like, mira, tenemos que hablar contigo, you know, we need to talk to you. So there I was, you know, and I'm fluently um, bilingual. But it was, it was just something that just kind of like rolled out in an incredible way. And in the five years we've been, you know, um, handling this IP, we've only published three books, well, four books now. We published issue number one, issue number two, our crossover anthology that brought in La Borinquena and the DC Comics universe. And we just published a, a special edition comic book this last December uh, to commemorate Puerto Rico's 125th anniversary, uh, the flag of the, one, uh, the anniversary of the flag. So it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's, it's been an incredible journey. And, and I, I have talked at universities or sometimes even at public libraries. And, you know, there'll be every now and then someone who asks, well, how do I break in? To the industry as if i have this you know uh solution and i was like well let me see uh and i told them everything i kind of like said you know like well wait until you're like you're like maybe in like your late 30s before you start doing your first art show and then maybe in, in your 40s you start publishing your own comics because there really isn't a cookie cutter solution and even the late stan lee didn't really kind of like make it into his own until he was in his 40s 
You know, he, this wasn't someone like out the gate that was like coming up with all these amazing ideas and IPs and people were respecting them. He literally created an, his own diploma, Stan Lee, because they were like, well, if this comic book thing doesn't work out, at least I can go back to writing the great American novel. You know, with me, it was like, you know, I didn't even think of that. I just, I kept my long Puerto Rican name, you know, with all the, all the vowels in there and all the syllables. And here we are, you know. You seem to have tapped into an audience that maybe a lot of the, the mainstream publishers haven't quite tapped into. And you, you, you resonate in a way that I'm assuming is really going to excite that, that audience that wants to buy uh, comics that, that represent them. So what sort of feedback have you gotten from readers and, and fans, either, you know, letters or social media? Most of our feedback comes um, from social media. That's the world we live in today, right? You know, uh, immediately, that, that instant, instant response, commenting on posts, uh, and overwhelmingly, the response is, thank you. Even, even uh, this morning, somebody just uh, tweeted a, a photo of their um, mask, because we have La Borinquena merchandise, so they're wearing their respirator mask with a La Borinquena image, and they tweeted, thank you um, for creating this character for us. You know? And it's, it's across the board, um, young, young women, uh, young men, um, parents, children, college students, other artists. And interestingly enough, the, the book is doing incredibly well across the United States. It's, it's, it's recognized and, and celebrated in Puerto Rico, but it's really across the U.S. I mean, constantly we're getting um, pickup stories, which is, you know, in the, in, the, in the media, it's when I'll see myself being talked about or La Borinquena being talked about, and I was never actually approached for an interview. I recall the New York Times published an article, 10 Latin superheroes that you need to know about if you're going to attend Comic-Con this year, and there... And the cover image for the story was La Borinquena. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I got this Google alert that the New York Times was writing about me. And I'm like, gee whiz, I hope it's good. You know? Um, so it's like, that's kind of like where we are to this day. And the response has been incredibly um, well. And I think also because one of the things we've done with our IP is that we're the only IP that exists that is um, intrinsically aligned with philanthropic work. You know, we, when we um, started La Borinquena out, out the gate, when she was on that float, we were selling t-shirts to raise money for scholarships for young Latin students. And then uh, a year and a half later, when we published Reconstruction, the, the crossover anthology with La Borinquena and the DC Comics universe, Wonder Woman, Batman, Superman, you know, we raised close to $200,000 from the sales of that book. And that gave us a huge chunk of, 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 of revenue that we were able to establish our grants program. My own partner, Kyung, came up with the idea. She said, let's not write a check to just one nonprofit in, in kind of this crisis mode, which most people do when there's a crisis. Oh, we raise money and we'll give it. But she saw the value of creating a sustainable philanthropic project. And she said, let's take this money and distribute it over the course of a few years until the money runs out. And that's what we did. We vetted not-for-profits. We had them um, fill out um, requests for proposals. And annually, we've been awarding grants. Over the last few years, we've awarded $165,000 in grants. And we're quite easily the only comic book that actually has done this. We take the whole concept of superheroism, social justice, out of the panels and into real life. And we celebrate real heroes that are on the ground doing incredibly heroic work. And we literally use our character as kind of like the, the gauge, you know. She, she's an afro Puerto Rican character, so we support organizations in Puerto Rico that celebrate and preserve afro Puerto Rican heritage. She is a, an environmental science student, so we support organizations in Puerto Rico that work with environmental justice, work to raise awareness around climate change, uh, invest in sustainable farming. She's a young woman, so we invest in organizations that provide um, services um, to, to children either in media literacy or in arts or even in women's health um, as well. So all of these um, organizations that we end up supporting are a reflection of our character. And I think that's one of the reasons why the, the project continues, because at some point we realized that anything that anyone purchases through our website pretty much continues to support our efforts, because myself and my partner, we, we volunteer our time to do this grants program. We visit Puerto Rico out of our own pocket. We distribute these grants. We follow up with organizations. Even during the pandemic, we eliminated the, the application process and just sought out organizations and just gave them micro grants because of the work that they were doing during the pandemic was unprecedented. And they were still very relevant, working with children, working with families, working with communities. And that's, I think, one of the things that, you know, that we're really invested in. And, and, and this year is looking to be something like that, too. We're um, launching a new project with the National Resources Defense Council, which we're super excited about because this is going to be the first time that we're going to be affiliated with an incredible um, renewable energy project. I mean, they're literally going to be installing solar panels. In, in Puerto Rico, and this is kind of like all of the, the result of what happens after Hurricane Maria. 
You know, they, it isn't just something that's going to be resolved in a few weeks or a few months. I mean, there are still homes in Puerto Rico that are covered in blue tarps. There are still hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans living across the United States that were displaced as a result of the hurricane. They will never have their, their homes again because they were completely lost. So our work with this comic and this IP is really kind of a, a long term. You know, we're really trying to, to, to create a, a, a way of like reinterpreting what comic books should be about. You know, comic books in my youth inspired me to be a storyteller. Comic books in my youth inspired me to become an activist. You know, I would I would march and protest, and afterwards we'll go to St. Mark's Comics in the in the in the village to pick up the latest copies of X Men or Spider Man. You know, it was it was affirming what what I believed in. But I don't I think at some point there was a massive disconnect, and you know these IPs became corporate brands and are more associated with um, pajamas and fruit roll-ups than they are with actually making real significant social change. So I think we're kind of going back to, 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 to the core um, beginning of where comic books came from and why they were created. I mean, like literally thinking about Captain America number one, knocking out Adolf Hitler, those are the origins of where comic books came from, right? So we're, we're, we're taking that, and I'm a student, and I'm a fan of, of comics. So I don't look at creating La Guarinquena as uh, this came out of a, this vacuum. No, I'm, I'm following formulas that have existed, but instead of tapping into um, uh, Western civilization or Western forms of mythology, like that may come from Roman, Greek, Norse, or even even like scriptures from the Bible, I'm looking to Taino mysticism, the, the indigenous people of the Caribbean island, and looking at that mythology, and looking at that mysticism to really kind of like forge a, uh, an origin story that, that works. And even, even in the character design, many, many, many people have told me including um, comic book legend himself, George Perez, who many who won't know um, pretty much rebooted Wonder Woman. The Wonder Woman that we see on the screen by Gal Gadot was the work that George Perez did as a writer and artist in the 1980s, created um, the, the new Teen Titan character, you know, Nightwing, Cyborg, Starfire, Raven, right? Co-created it with Marv Wolfman, and also was an artist behind the Infinity Gauntlet, this entire Avengers Endgame franchise, right? George Perez, who I brought to Puerto Rico for the first time in his career, was enamored by La Boringueña's costume. He said he loved the, how it was asymmetrical, but how it was still kind of classic at the same time, and told me that he would not accept no for an answer, that he was going to draw a cover for me. And he said, I could do whatever I wanted to do with this cover. I could choose to use it. I could, I could um, choose not to use it, but he wanted to draw the cover. And that became the cover of our second issue. And he even gave us the original artwork. And if anyone knows anything about original comic book artwork, you know, original comic book artwork can sell in the hundreds, if not the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, but to have a, an artist such as George Perez, who is also Puerto Rican like me, to validate the costume design and to also validate it by an actual like, work of art. And then like within months of drawing that, he said, I'm officially retiring from the comic book industry. To know that our comic book cover was one of the last covers he actually drew, it's, it's just mind-blowing. And it's just kind of like an, an incredible a affirmation. You know, so that, and that's the response. You know, we've, we've been um, people online saying they love the costume, people online saying they love our philanthropic work, legends like George Perez validating it, and even actor, activist Rosario Dawson dressing up as La Borinquena for Halloween a couple of years ago. And, and, and as a result of her love for the character, her reaching out to us and collaborating with us. And we did an incredibly successful campaign with her from the general election through the Georgia runoffs, where we produced a series of animated um, public service announcements of La Borinquena engaging Latinx voters to register and to turn out to vote. Rosario Dawson herself with the voice of La Borinquena. I'm La Borinquena, and I've teamed up with Voto Latino to ensure that Latinx Georgians line up to vote in this runoff election. She came to us. She was like, I love what you guys are doing with La Borinquena. I want to do more work with you guys. So it's like, it's, it's like something that's never been seen. I mean, there are a lot of independent IPs out there, and there are even like major IPs under these major corporations that people still have yet to, to uncover, you know, and, and here we are. It's really interesting because you're able to, to craft stories that are uh, engaging to an audience and yet have a point and a purpose, and you're able to do it in a way that engages them so that they want to be more involved. And, and that's got to be a, a fine balancing act, you know, having the traditional elements of superheroics along with an actual message and call to action. So as a writer or as an editor, how are you sort of putting all of that together to make sure that it's entertaining and at the same time has that impact that you want it to have. I look at it as uh, I'm in front of my um, stove preparing a hot pot of Sancocho. And Sancocho is a stew that's, um, that's enjoyed in Puerto Rico, but also throughout Latin America. It's a hearty stew with vegetables, with meat, 
and a very thick broth, but it's kind of like a mix of everything. And every region cooks it differently. And you kind of have to like measure out the spices to see how, how you want it to taste and maybe a little, a little more savory, a little more salty. When I'm writing these stories, I approach it that way. And I love using the metaphor of like Sancocho because that's my character's favorite meal. She literally said it in the first issue. Because I believe that everyone has a particular taste. Everyone has a particular um, point of, of entry into the, into the writing, so into the story. So when I'm writing and when I'm producing these stories, I approach my work with the same level of research that a scholar would. I have not crafted a story that is um, fantastical in nature uh, or, or a universe that's completely fantastical in nature. Even, you know, some, some universes and cities are rooted in reality, you know, from Metropolis to Wakanda, et cetera, right? They're still fantastical, right? I'm actually drawing reference from a real place, an island in the Caribbean where three million Puerto Ricans with U.S. citizenship who are living in a colonial state for the last 123 years under the United States. That's a real life um, world. And there's so much rich history that because of the colony of the United States, it's completely erased and overlooked. Puerto Ricans on the island don't even know their own history. They, they can debate you about um, U.S. history, because that's what they're learning in school. And it isn't until many of them make it to institutions of higher learning that they actually uncover the real history that's been, um, that's been um, hidden from them for years. So a lot of the work that I do, I'm constantly finding ways. I don't want a soapbox. I don't want to have a, a, a character that's monologuing. But I believe in Easter eggs. In Spanish, we, we refer to them as indirectas, where you kind of like make a little reference and hopefully somebody gets what you're trying to say so you don't actually have to speak directly at it. Like literally the word means indirectly, right? And I try to put little nuances either in a panel or in an exchange between two characters. And, and I kind of put it out there. And I, what I never expected is for it to come back. And when I hear from high school teachers or um, the graduate students or graduate students that are studying and teaching my books, and they'll literally pull up a panel. And I, I got to sit in a... Uh, a classroom at, at Penn State where a graduate student was teaching and she invited me to sit in the, in the classroom and I'm just blown away because she's comparing the work to um, Eisner, who is um, pretty much the founder and, 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 and the, and the art storyteller who came up with the word sequential art, sequential art storytelling. And she's comparing the, my, my work, saying that I'm pretty much breaking every rule that Eisner set in, in storytelling, you know. And then at one point she cut, she, she, she defaults to me. She's like, so, so do you want to add anything? And I'm like, I'm good. I'm enjoying this ride. I don't need to take the wheel, you know? And so when I'm writing, there's a lot of, there's a lot of history that I put in, but I don't try to bog down literal history. I don't want it to become a history lesson. I look at it as my, as a young person, I listened to Public Enemy growing up in high school and Chuck D would occasionally just name drop. He wouldn't create an entire song about a historical figure. He would just name drop. He would say Malcolm X. And I was like, who's Malcolm X? And this is before Google. So you literally had to go to the library and be like, um, excuse me, librarian, anything on Malcolm X. I want to learn about Malcolm X. But now with Google, you can read the comic book and immediately go, okay, what, is the, what does that flag mean? You can literally take your phone and scan an image and Google will search for that image to see what I'm referencing in the actual comic book. So it's a, there's a lot of research, and, I, and when I'm writing, I have two monitors in my office. So one monitor will be my, my Word document, and the other monitor will be a browser. Where if, as I'm writing, a, a thought, a historical point will come to my mind, and I'll, re, and I'll Google it to confirm it. Okay, okay, great. And I, now I'll incorporate that. Or I'm watching videos, and I'm learning new phrases, and I go back to my script. Okay, i got to incorporate, even if it's just one word, i got to incorporate that one word. And then as I'm storytelling... I'm a very unorthodox writer because I'm an artist. I'm a graphic designer. So I haven't even coined the phrase yet. I have to figure it out. But I'm lettering and writing at the same time. So I write a script that's kind of like an outline. And then I, I'll, I'll get my artwork from my artist. But as I'm actually putting the pages together and putting the dialogue bubbles, I'm actually rewriting myself. My second book, I completely rewrote. Even though the artwork already came in, I completely rewrote it. And my art team was like blown away. They were like, where did this, how did this story happen? I was like, well, I just felt that the conflict that I originally had with this really didn't have that much merit. So I decided to create a completely different conflict with the character. And that conflict I felt that was more viable was for the character herself to have an internal conflict, kind of like an identity crisis. Like, who am I? Am I the suit or am I wearing the suit? You know, that kind of, which I feel is like a universal concept with, with superheroes, you know, is 
who is the, who is really the id? Is it Batman or is it Bruce Wayne? Like which one? Is, which which one is the mask and which one is actually the real the real person? So I thought to myself, this is a classic comic book trope. Let me kind of like work my own way of telling that story. So yeah, it, it's 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 a lot of non traditional storytelling, and I think because of the digital age that we live in, I can literally have Microsoft Word and Adobe Illustrator on two different screens and constantly work work them with each other. I love and I'm and like really adept at typographic design. I'm able to work that. And I'll edit myself. Sometimes we're like, okay, that's way too much. I got to take all that up because this art is so beautiful. I just want the art to literally speak for itself. I, I see we have just about one minute left before we have to wrap up our conversation. If people watching wanted to find out more about you and your work, where can they find you on the web? La-Borinquena.com. That's the easiest place to find us. Our website is where our store is. You can get an overview of our philanthropic work as well as watch videos of some of the um, awardees that we've been um, supporting over the last years, uh, as well as um, see a lot of the campaigns we've done. For example, um, the, um, the newest music video we did commemorating the 125th anniversary of the Puerto Rican flag. We did our first music video, which is amazing. Like I literally wrote my first song and I had celebrities singing to this song. And you could also see the public service announcements of La Borinquena, um, voiced by Rosario Dawson. So that's the spot to go, la-borinquena.com. <laughs> well, Edgardo, thank you so much for taking time out to talk with me today. It's been a really fast half hour. And uh, again, thank you so much for being able to, to share a few minutes with us. And I'd like to thank you at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon. Comic Culture is a production of the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke.